In today's episode, Alex and I dive into something that is essential for you to continue making progress in the gym. You got it, deloads. We go into all of the signs that you might need a deload or why you might not actually need a deload. Make sure you like and subscribe and share this with a friend and we'll catch you on the inside. We got some pretty good news this week, didn't we? What was it? It was that Tucker is officially cleared from his ACL surgery, not to the point where he can rough house yet, but he can have open access to the house. He can do stairs. He can do longer walks. He doesn't have to have support while doing activities. So really just have to wait about four more weeks for rough housing. He's allowed to like play with toys, just him. We can't like have him and Gus, you know. Jump on each other, yeah. jumping on each other, but we can throw toys on t- carpet for him to go and get, and just really helps to have open access to the house as well. That we're not always having to have all of our eyes on him. It was a rough eight weeks. Um, now that we're at the tail end of it, it seems like it went semi fast, but in the moment, it was a challenging bit of time and and uh, having to walk with him on the sling and go out with him every single time he's got to go outside and. Um, all that was a, a challenging bit. I can't agree with you that it felt like it was fast, but uh, to each their own. <laughs> I am very glad that they can also do double dog walks now because they had to do separate dog walks, which they hated. And the other one would just whine at the door the whole time the other one was on their W and it was madness. So now they have gone on multiple walks. The first one was on Saturday that they got to do together for eight after eight weeks and they were hype for it they're very happy (laughs) uh so anything else fun happened this weekend for you we're keeping up with our intent or goal of of doing things on the weekend which has been a very fun process to push ourselves into doing because if we just leave ourselves to our own uh decisions i suppose we will generally pick to stay in and and stay home and do quote unquote nothing. So it's been nice to go out and do things. We went to a friend of ours event for her company. So it was a, she owns a a jewelry company, company nano. And so uh, it was really fun to, to be there and to see all the people there and just getting to see them and, and being in her element was fun. Yeah, if you want some good jewelry, check out Cuffed by Nano. I got new permanent bracelets, which I had been wanting, permanent jewelry, and I absolutely love them. So I'm super duper excited about it. And we've been keeping up with our yoga. And this past Sunday was both of our best classes yet. Boom. I am. I'm getting much better. It was uh, the most fluent class that I have taken. And I am now either nine weeks consistent or 10 weeks consistent of going one or two times, more often twice, Mm -hmm. um, going consistently to classes, which has been a transformative experience, has helped my resistance training a ton. And uh, I actually feel like my body is not just this big block of (laughs) one piece of body. I can move fluently and my spine can rotate and expand. Extend and flex, and it's very interesting to see my body move the way that it does. <laughs> that with physical therapy, I mean, they're not ready for you here in a few <laughs> weeks. You're going to be rocking and rolling, coming much more well rounded and not just strong, if you will. Yeah, I we normally don't watch each other a ton when we're doing yoga because you know we're focused on our own practice, but every once in a while, we'll catch some glimpses of you. And uh, on Sunday, being able to see you. And a, I don't know all of the names when they say them, I sometimes know what to go into, but I'm not perfect at knowing exactly what each thing is, but you were able to really sink down into like a lower, uh, squat that I've never seen you been able to like be that low and have your legs so wide. Um, so that was really cool to see. Yeah. And the, the single leg stuff, I was able to do that on one attempt on all of them, which was a interesting experience. Cause I normally have to reset and, um, fumble around and probably ruin the experience for the person behind me who's trying to also focus. And, uh, so that was a, a cool experience. I was lit. You can, uh, there are times within the yoga class that I throw myself a little bit of a celebration and fist pump and those different things, which is not a common, if you've gone to yoga classes, you don't really see that a whole lot, but I get lit when I uh, do things better or I can tell that I've improved in a specific movement from the time before or the week before. And so I gave myself a pretty big hype up after 
having done those single leg movements <laughs> yeah. one time. It was awesome. I was able to do with support the flying splits, which is, I don't know when I'll ever be able to do that without support, but one day I'll get there. Um, I already could do birds of paradise, but it was good to have it back in my practice. And uh, I could do normal crow, but I hadn't ever nailed down side crow, but I got side crow and fallen angel, which if you just fall on your head during side crow, just lift up your other leg and it's another pose, just go with the flow there. So it was cool to get some of those rocking and rolling. I really want to be able to get not just dancer where I'm like hinged over, but being able to get like both my hands behind me and holding my foot. I think that would, that be, would pretty be incredible. Pretty insane. I'm just trying to connect my hands <laughs> when I'm laying flat on my stomach. So you yeah, always a good one. <laughs> yeah. I, the fact that I can't put my hands together is such a defeating moment when a, she instructs us to do that. And I try every single time I can like twist my fingers or my hands to like get my pointing fingers connected, but then I'm like really pulling. So then I just end up putting my arms to my side and trying to like do as best as I possibly can with the hope of, you know, at the end of this year, being able to connect my hands comfortably. Yeah. Like when you're in the Superman position and yes. the hands come behind, I think a huge moment for you is when you get, um, like single leg, uh, pigeon. Um, I think that'll be a really big moment for you. If I knew what that was, when you have the agree. leg bent in front of you and your other leg behind you. Oh yeah. I can't, I have to lay on my back for that one. Yeah. You do like a figure four. Yeah. Yeah. I think when you get that, that's going to be really awesome. It's all awesome. I love it all. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. Well, I know that on Sunday, neither of us trained, but we did do yoga. And has it been hard for you in the past to take days off of training? Not necessarily. I think that it is something where with training, I love pushing my limits. And so the rest days themselves have been something I've desperately needed. And so I don't find a whole lot of challenge in taking the rest days, but they're certainly much better taken now relative to <laughs> years past where I would train far too frequently, but the rest days themselves, I was still taking type situation, but I was training five or six days a week at that time to where now I'm training four days a week, but I'm having much better quality of sessions. And I would say since I've shifted to training four days a week, I would say that my progress has been better from adding muscle tissue, adding strength, and all those different factors. I know a lot of people are scared to only train four days a week. They think if they're not training five or six days a week, they're going to lose all of their progress. And I'm very thankful because I feel like outside of like the first year of training, I really went to four days a week, and I've consistently been around four days a week. There's been some times where we've ticked up to five, but it's been at four. But I know for myself that I have a lot of clients that struggle with taking rest days. Do you find that for your clients that they have a hard time taking days off in general? Yes. I think that if they are equating it to progress is only made if I'm training, then they really have trouble with it because once they get to the understanding that their progress is much more dictated on what they're doing outside of the gym, there's a, a certainly a component to having to train hard and, and having quality volume allocations and all those different factors. But a larger portion of your day is not going to be in the gym. And so once they realize that if they can handle their business outside of the gym, their progress is that much better. Oftentimes that shifts the mentality of struggling with those days off. Yeah. So when it comes to, I know I was just talking about rest days, but deloads of we regularly program those in and we're normally pretty proactive. So we don't get to the point that someone needs a longer deload because they've gotten to um, a place where they've overstressed or overtrained. With those clients that struggle with taking days off, when you introduce a deload to them, what, where is their mindset at and what do you normally talk through with them? With the deload, I would say that explaining to them all of the intricacies of what the deload is providing for them and giving them education. I think that this is how we approach all the different factors within our coaching is providing knowledge and education as to why these things are being implemented so that they're not just following blindly. And then by the time that they leave our service, they're in a situation where they say, you know, it worked really well 
when I was there, but I have no idea how to, how to apply anything that they taught me in that time frame. So I'm just going to have to hire another coach and start this whole process again. And so what we, what we do is that we are going to provide them with that knowledge and understanding of why it is important so that they're not having this feeling of, um, well, I, I could be making better progress doing this. Like it, it is very plain as day as this is why we're doing this. And then we're in a position that they can make better progress following the deload itself. A hundred percent. And I think that that what you mentioned earlier of if you train hard enough when you're in the gym, then you have a lot of peace of mind of just being able to do your work there. And within physique development, I feel like we really hammer down on showing people how to truly train so that they can have so much more peace when it comes to rest days and taking those deloads. So when it comes to a deload, what are things that you do explain to clients? For myself, I always tell them that they got a deload so that they can reload and get back after it. And when it comes to deloads, it's not always taking just a full week completely out of the gym. Sometimes that's exactly what a client needs. And I know some of my clients listening have definitely heard me tell them to just not train for a full week, even if that includes getting other types of movement in. But sometimes it can just be bringing back some of that training volume or training frequency, depending on what the client needs. When I'm explaining it to a client, the first thing that I want to illustrate is the success that they've had leading into the deload itself. I think that that is really important for us to see the progressions within the training that were taken prior to taking the deload and, and why it is necessary at that time. Because what we're going to be doing with the training leading into that time is going to be increasing volume allocations, um, pushing things from a progressive overload perspective. And then what are some of the biofeedback markers? that are showing me that it's going to be necessary for us to take the deload at that moment. And within the deloads themselves, I may have something programmed for them to have a deload at this particular time following this particular stimulus. But depending on what their biofeedback looks like, we may not end up taking that deload and continuing to push with the particular training that is in place. And so it is going to be something where we are proactively putting them in, but it is also going to be reactive depending on where the progress is for the athlete itself. And so by giving them the overview of how it's being applied within their training, it allows for them to see the benefit that is certainly there, but also a client who is new may be coming in and probably needing to start with the deload as well because of where they were at within their training or within their nutrition allocations and those different factors. Because when we look at a deload as a whole, as you said, it is going to be something where it has a lot of different definitions. The The overarching viewpoint of it is that it's going to be a week with decreased intensity or decreased overall training volume. And so how we go about that is going to be dependent on the person. And so when we look at a, a deload, are we looking at the individual who really just enjoys training hard? Well, in that case, we may have just very much so decreased training frequency and overall volume, but giving them just a few sets to where they can still train hard in that time frame. When we look at it from an accumulative perspective, it's still significantly less, but they're getting the thing that they love the most by getting to still train hard. Is it the individual who just needs some time away from the gym in its entirety? Sure. If, if that's the case, then that person can take some time away and do other modes of fitness, things like yoga, things like hiking, those different factors to take a step away from resistance training to be able to come back with the recharge batteries and reload it, as you said earlier, uh, to, to attack the next training block and, and those different factors. So there's many different ways that we can look at that. That's just two examples within multiple that we see within our clients. It's going to be very dependent on the individual and what is needed for for the circumstance at hand. I love that and that you really talked about the individual and the that circumstance is going to play in. And I think that's really imperative when we're looking at each client is seeing what they need and what's going to allow them to keep going forward because that's really the whole point of a deload. It's to allow you to maximize your results moving forward and to ensure you don't get to that overtrained or overstressed spot. And so being able to see, oh, this client actually might see more stress 
stress by taking a full week off of training because they mentally really need that escape, then we can go ahead and lower that volume and still have them in there. Uh, and I, I just love that approach because a deload isn't a one size fits all. It's not just here's deload training or just take the week off and you're good to go because it really depends on the person's goal as well as where the person specifically is and their headspace. So I absolutely love that you brought that up as well as outlining what it has looked like going into it because I found the most confusion surrounding or most resistance to taking a deload is when someone truly doesn't understand why they're taking it. And I've made that mistake before of assuming someone understands the benefit of a deload and saying, hey, we're going into a deload and not diving as deep into it and then feeling their resistance or seeing that the deload really didn't get the benefit I wanted out of it because I didn't take the step to really make sure the client was on board. And so that's been something years ago that I definitely learned from experience of always take time to really explain what your thought process is, because not only is that going to allow someone to have those tools past working with us, but it's also just going to allow them to get the most benefit out of the thing we're really trying to do. And we've experienced that just within communication between the two of us for any aspect of being able to really see where the other person's headspace is at. So we can say, oh, okay, yeah, I, I, I see where you're going with it. Let's keep going that direction. I think that the biggest issue that comes up within deloads is that it's it's programmed at week eight of a program itself, and it's not actually taking into consideration what the person where the person is at or how they're progressing within the training. Because if it's just programmed in and maybe you're at a place where you're finally figuring out your proper weight selection for the rep ranges that are there, and you're finally starting to make progress and your execution's getting aligned and your nutrition's in a better spot and you're just on a wave of momentum that is really positive for your progress, that's when deloads don't make sense. Like that's when they're just programmed in no matter what, that's where you run into issues. And this is, you know, one-off programs that people purchase. This is some of the issues that they run into where there may be a progression in place that is um, designed for them to taper up volume and taper up training intensity to have this, this <clears throat> decrease and have this deload at this proper time when we look at it just in the context of a textbook that's how it would apply but the reality is is depending on where that person's uh, training ability is at their training knowledge and all those different factors the acclimation as they get into the stimulus may be significantly different than what a textbook would provide and so they may have two or three weeks of ramping things up of really not even getting to a higher intensity threshold that would be necessary for that progression to come in in play and so then by the time they get to the devo they're like i don't really need this this doesn't seem like it was providing much benefit. And then on the flip side, it could be someone who has a lot of training knowledge and a lot of training intensity, and they're able to really push the boundaries within volume and, and all those different factors. And they needed the deload even earlier than what it was prescribed. And so this is where individualized program design comes so into play and so necessary for you to actually have the benefit from the deloaded training. Because if we're just having these one-off programs, it gets very difficult because we're not taking in the consideration of what that person is experiencing or how they're navigating through the training itself. And I think another thing that really needs to be taken into consideration if you are a coach is seeing someone train, because that's another mistake I made early on within coaching is I wouldn't be getting training videos from people. And I would just think, all right, now's about the time that I they would need a deload or that I would need a deload. And then come to find out they're not training at the intensity I thought that they were, and they're not pushing themselves. So really, they could have gone many, many more weeks to get that done. So really being able to gauge training videos and footage is going to be so helpful to see where someone needs to pull back possibly uh, and really understanding what volume they're at. Because even if you're looking at a training log, you're not being able to necessarily see how what their RPE was when they were performing the exercise. So Let's dive into some of the, the biofeedback components that we're looking for that would put someone in a situation where a deload is potentially the best option for them. So what are, name a couple of things that come to mind for you and we'll kind of just go back and forth here. 
I would say the easiest for me to see within a client is going to be their digestion starting to get off track. And there's not really another reason that it's coming out of it's getting a little bit wonky, as well as seeing inflammation, uh, where again, it really doesn't make sense that they're seeing inflammation outside of training being a little bit too much, uh, or falling into issues with sleep of their sleep just starts to get really broken up. Again, their sleep routines stay the same. They've done a great job of really plugging in the habits that need to be in place for their digestion and their sleep. But those things are still um, starting to have some off kilter numbers. Yeah, I think an important part there is that the factors that are necessary to maximize those things within stress management as well as um, sleep hygiene and all those different factors, hormonal function, those things are already taken care of. And then there's still things going on with that that would thereafter allow for us to say, okay, a deload is potentially necessary because there's a lot of things that those three things can be dictated by that have nothing to do with training. Yeah. And so it, if you're experiencing uh, hormonal fluctuations, acne, inflammation, whatever the situation is, these things can lead us to an understanding that a deload is necessary, but are not a one-for-one correlation. And so don't jump the gun listening to this and say, oh my gosh, I'm having a breakout, I'm sleeping like shit, and I definitely need a deload. It very well could be the case. That very well could be true, but it's not an immediate response. The other factor is looking at things from a training performance. How long is it taking us to recover from the training itself? Are we, let's say that we have a training stimulus in place that we're training upper lower and we have our lower body session on Monday and then our second lower body session on Thursday. We have adequate rest period in between. We should be fresh by the time we get to that second lower body session. If we are having continuous weeks in which we are not recovering by that second lower body session, We either need to decrease overall training volume or getting into a deload could be advantageous there. The other thing to keep into consideration on that side of things is that if it's a new training stimulus, it's a new training volume and those different factors, that's going to be something that you need to give time. It's not just a a one week analysis and you find yourself in a situation where you need to get into the deload now. It's something where you're going to need to take weeks of collecting the data to have a better understanding. Because when we're analyzing the implementation of a deload, I think that oftentimes when people are programming for themselves, it gets very emotionally driven where they go in to hit a specific number on their squat and it ends up being 20 pounds less than the week they did or the the set that they did last week for that particular exercise. And they find themselves in a situation where it's like, okay, I need a deload. I'm getting weaker. <laughs> All these, it's like, there are so many things that contribute to your training performance on a day-to-day basis. And if you have one off session, that does not mean that you need to back off and get into a deload so that you can recharge the batteries. This is a sign that you probably need to look at at the things that are influencing your training performance to put you in a position where the next week, are we having another week where we've underperformed? If we have consecutive weeks or even three weeks in a row, that's a sign that's like, okay, we probably need to back off and and get into a deload and those different factors, as well as are we feeling like we're just accruing a lot of joint pain as we're training. That's going to be something that we want to keep in mind. Now, you may be accruing joint pain because you just suck at (laughs) executing the movements. Like that's a a very strong possibility. And so if your execution is in a great spot and you're still feeling like you're accumulating a lot of joint pain and discomfort and feeling like your knees are inflamed, your elbows are inflamed, that may be a sign for you to take um, a step back and, and deload in that position as well. And so it's going to be much more of an accumulation of data rather than a single day's worth of data that you're looking at to decide if getting into a deload is the best decision for you. The whole time you were talking, the main thing Mm -hmm. I was thinking was the word data. And you just brought it home right there at the end, because that's what I often see is people aren't tracking enough data points to truly understand. And they're making very emotionally driven decisions instead of data driven decisions, where the example you gave of, okay, they have one day where they're not able to hit the weight that they hit the week before. You can get very emotional in that, where if you look and see, oh, I actually didn't 
eat very close to this meal and I or this training session. And so then I was an hour past when I would have normally trained. So that's why my strength was a little off. Or maybe I got a little bit less sleep last night or I didn't have enough water. There's a multitude of different factors that come into place. So it is so true that it's not just one data point. It's not just one training session. It's looking at the culmination of data and being able to make a decision based off of that that's going to be the most productive for you to be able to move forward. Are you wanting to hire the last coach you will ever need? Well, look no further. Physique Development is here to help you. We have a huge emphasis on knowledge and communication and making sure you know how to get yourself in the best position so you never have to hire another coach again. If this sounds great to you, then go ahead and fill out the inquiry link in the show notes or the description box, and we would love to get on a call with you. Another reason that oftentimes people will recommend a deload is lack of motivation to train. This is an interesting one to me uh, because I, I I don't know anyone really who goes in there bright-eyed and bushy-tailed every time they go in to train. I would say that most individuals are going in with you know 50% of their sessions being extremely motivated and ready to crush it type situation. And then the other half of their sessions, they're getting in there because they know they need to and it's it's part of their day and they know they're going to feel better because of it and they've got to trudge through and, and those different factors. And so the lack of motivation is an interesting one. I think that if you're in a place of feeling a lack of motivation to train, what you need to look at is, are you enjoying the way that you're training? Are you training in a specific way because of your favorite influencer training a particular way? And you're like, I want to look like her, thus I'm going to train this way. But it's not something that you enjoy. You just want to look like that person, so you just train that way. I think that finding a way of fitness that is what you enjoy and fills your cup up and you're uh, enjoying in that moment because this is ever changing, right? Like our training over time, over a decade, over two decades is going to look different. There's going to be variables that are the same, but there are things that are going to change with the seasons of life. Like as we have moved into greater responsibilities within our business ownership, this is something that we've had to change our training because I do not have two and a half hours to commit to the gym five days a week as I did 10 years ago to situation. And I loved training like that. I, at times, wish that I still could train like that. I, I don't think that it is a, a part of my life now, it would not work in terms of my priorities as well as the time that I have available to train. And if I was to hold myself to that standard and be like, well, I, I need to train this particular way for me to see the progress that I think that I want to see, I would be very demotivated all the time because I would be able to train like that once a week. So congratulations, buddy. You're getting one training session a weekend relative to actually getting in quality sessions and pivoting to something that is going to fit more with my schedule. And I'm going to be more motivated to do because I'm being more accomplished, right? And so that's the thing with motivation that throws me for a loop that people put this as like a key marker for needing a deload. I think that it's a key marker to look introspectively and see is this really what you want to be doing? I think also recognizing how training fits into your schedule plays a big role because I've been very open with my clients and just on socials that as the day goes on, I get so much less motivated to train. And so if I didn't plan my training sessions to be earlier in the day of whether it's before breakfast or it's midday, then I would be extremely unmotivated to get them done because I don't like training at that time. And I also need to schedule it for it to get done. Or then I'm coming into a place where I'm not, like you said, bright eye and bushy tail jumping up like I'm going to go train. It's part of my routine. And even this morning, I was debating between do I go out there or do I keep working because I have more things I need to get done at my desk. And I realized I put it in at this time because this was the only time that I could do it. And I realized I was training legs. And I then tried to talk myself out of training legs, again, not bright eye and bushy tailed, and then thought, this is what I have to do today. You're going to get in there and train legs. And I was even having this conversation with them talking about 
someone had made a comment about how much uh, we work. And I had said, I don't even think about it that way. Like I understand we work a, a large amount, but it's not constantly coursing through my brain because I love what I do and I love training, but I also am understanding of what role this time in our life plays. And so I've just accepted it's a part of what life is right now. So I'm not constantly bringing it up of I'm, I'm not motivated or I have to work a lot. I'm thinking, this work needs to be done. That's the end of it. And I think a lot of people would benefit from challenging themselves more mentally and getting in when they don't have motivation to do things, because I think that shows you your strength time and time again. I guarantee you're not motivated to get up and go to work each morning. I'm not even motivated to wash my face every morning or maybe brush my teeth, but I still get it done because it's something that I have committed to what the outcome is. Is, and so I'm going to be committed to what the process is as a whole. I love that you lay that out. And I, I'm appreciative for you bringing that to the forefront of the listeners' minds here, because I think it's very valuable. Now that we've identified the biofeedback markers that we're looking for to implement a deload, we've talked briefly on the periodization or, or how we would work to that point. Do you want to give greater context to your thought process and, and how you go about the program design to get to a deload or, or kind of earn that deload throughout a, a training program, for example. I think an interesting way to look at this, and it's another part of deloads, is like I said, deloads aren't just taking the week off of training. Sometimes it can be just desensitizing you from a certain stimulus. And so this is oftentimes the way that I go about it or what I keep in mind when I'm building out somebody's uh, mesocycle or I'm building out what their training looks like and when a deload might need to come into place. And so I normally have a checkpoint with myself every few weeks for a client to review what they've done and where we're headed. And I really like to do that at a four-week mark just because it allows me to have like a month mark in my head and to be able to review what they've done. And I oftentimes send a client, like you mentioned, of what we've done in that time frame, showing them side-by-side -side pictures, what I'm seeing in it, and then being able to talk about what those next steps are moving forward. And so with this, I had a client come to me and she was actually doing hypertrophy training constantly. That was all that she was doing when she came to me and hadn't done any other type of training. And so when we look at that, if you subject your body to the same type of training time and time again, then it's going to decrease the rate your body adapts over time because you need to stress your body in order for it to change. But when you put a training stimulus in place, the longer that you're in it, the um, I'm not saying the less helpful it is, but your body does begin to adapt and you do need to make a change from there. And that doesn't mean changing your training every single day and looking up the newest swipe workout, but it is paying attention to looking at the type of stress and the pathways that are being worked. And so because she had done hypertrophy, 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 then it was recognizing she needs a deload. She still needs to train, but we really need to get her out of that hypertrophy to work these different pathways that she's needing to in order to progress because she was hitting a lot of plateaus. And that's another thing that I see is if someone's just hitting a plateau, even if they're checking all of the boxes or doing all of the right things, it can be because they have not changed the type of training that they're doing. And so with that, I was able to really look at how her sets were laid out within the hypertrophy and how it was uh, spread across the different muscle groups and being able to also look at her goals and build out something that was a lot more strength-based so that it was able to sh really challenge her in lifting heavier weights with uh, longer rest periods because she had been in that like 30-second to 60-second rest period and just doing three to four sets of eight to 12. And so really challenging her of now you have to learn how to get efficient with doing four to six reps, which she hadn't been challenged in that way before. So it was a massive deload from hypertrophy training, but she was still training very hard just in a different stimulus. So that's just one example of how I'll be building it out for someone when I'm looking at what they've done leading up to uh, their next program. And within that strength phase, are you having less total sets per muscle group than what she was having within the hypertrophy phase or what's the thought process there? 
It can be done a few different ways, as we've mentioned, that it can be a decrease in frequency or decrease in volume. And for her, I did bring down sets just a little bit because I needed to really, I also had to take into consideration if she's increasing the load, that overall, when we're looking at the compiled volume is coming into place here. And so I did take down um, sets just a little bit because I was also really trying to nail down her execution. And so with that, I wanted her to not feel like her her sessions had to be super duper long because she was doing a new type of training and having to get video and possibly some new movements that she didn't feel as comfortable with. So I was able to bring those sets down and to really have her just focus on getting in there, performing the movement, getting video of it, and getting out. And I really vocalized to her that this isn't going to be as it's not going to be as flow as you have felt within training because this is a lot of new stuff and being able to make sure she had patience with herself and again outlining what my expectation was or how she I did expect her to feel so that she wasn't feeling so different and thinking I'm doing something wrong or this isn't what I should be doing again it's really our responsibility as the expert in the field to explain so that they feel a lot more confident and they feel feel a lot more aligned with what they're doing and that they're getting the correct result. I think that cumulative volume is one of the hardest things to track in general because you've got a situation where you could accumulate a ton of numerical volume by doing a bunch of sets that are not challenging. So you could be at an RPE of three or four for your sets and have this massive numerical volume allocation for the entire session, but really not have done much of anything. Things that we have identified from a research perspective is that intensity is going to be a big driver here and making sure that at a bare minimum of, of effective sets that we want to complete, that we are at an RPE of seven is that uh, we want to ensure that we have those hard sets. So the thing that I try with my clients in particular is tracking their, their hard sets. Like how many sets are we able to have per session that they are pushing above that seven RP threshold, eight, nine? Like a true eight or nine scoring is much more difficult than people would like to believe. They, they think that they had one or two left, but in reality, it was just one or two left before it actually started to be challenging. And so they're really at an RPE five and they thought that they were at a seven type situation. And so getting those training videos is a paramount example here, because if you don't have those training videos, you're in a place where it's pretty challenging to shoot properly on where to start from a volume perspective. You can take these general um, approaches of, of 10 to 20, 10 to 12 sets per muscle group and titrating it up in that fashion. But I think that there is more intricate nuanced detail that allows for the person to really uh, excel. I think that if you're getting into a, a program design for someone who you don't have any background on, using some of those general parameters is helpful to get the foundation going. But then as you're able to accumulate more volume or accumulate more data collection and those different factors with the training clips and seeing them push themselves to failure, and do they really understand what failure training is, that allows for you to periodize the training significantly better. So the more data that is collected, let's say that I have a client who's been working with me for a year, two years, three years, their program design is painfully more specific and periodized perfectly for them because of the data that we've been able to accumulate. They're able to make significantly greater strides to their physique because of these different factors than the person who just started with me yesterday, for example. Now, can that person who just started with me yesterday have great progress? For Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. They're, they're going to make great progress because of what you talked about, where they've come to me training a particular way and we're able to pivot into a way of training that they do not have a whole lot of adaptation or stimulus from. And so we have a large gap to be able to improve and to adapt in that particular way of training, whether that be whether that be strength or whether that be hypertrophy, whether that be metabolic and endurance-based training, there is a way for us to make drastic improvements. And oftentimes making that pivot makes huge dividends within body composition improvements and those different factors. And so by creating a, a periodization, it is going to be a matter of really understanding the baseline of sets that we're able to train at a high intensity and recover from. 
that's where we have to start. And then we want to be able to titrate that up, whether that be volume lifted with our weight lifted within the sets that are being prescribed, or that be added sets that we can take to a greater intensity. Because I assure you the individuals who are on social media and telling you that they take every set to failure are full of shit, shit. <laughs> full of shit. It is like to actually take a set to true failure and push yourself to that threshold, you're probably performing at most four sets a training session. Um, that's probably what I would suggest if if someone was to be taking it to absolute failure, I bet you're able to do four working sets and call it a day because of the overall systemic fatigue that would come about, the neurological fatigue and just how spent your body would be to be able to recover and train another day, probably four. And, and it's probably different in the sense of you take, let's talk about lower body, for example, you take a Bulgarian split squat set to true failure. Bottom out cannot contract another glute quad adductor fiber in your body. And this is with truly doing the exercise the right way, not using all of your other muscles to help something out. Right. Doing it the right way. You honestly, systemic fatigue wise, may have one really good set left in your whole session that you're able to really push for that. And so when I have someone come in and be like, I take every set to failure and I'm doing four sets of eight. And I'm like, so you did a set of eight for your first set and then a set of eight again, but they were both to failure and they were the same weight. And somehow you hit failure perfectly at eight every single time. That's not how this works. Like if you hit failure, there is going to be a fatigue onset that causes you to not be able to mimic that same output again for that same exact exercise. So if you're in a position where now, is it possible if you give yourself five or six minutes of rest period that you could go and do it again? Possibly. It's, it's a higher possibility than giving yourself one or two one minutes. Minute. <laughs> like it's a much higher possibility then. And I assure you that after I get up from a true bottomed out failure set of split squats, I am seeing stars and I'm having to really regain my consciousness essentially I can confirm. <laughs> after that set. And so looking at it in that context of really being able to push yourself within the training being the most important part of the stimulus or, or of the training and being able to create data guidelines around you doing so is how you're going to better periodize your training over time, as well as implement deloads at a much more efficient and useful rate relative to just having them in the program as we talked about. And so this is where working with a coach and, and, and I, when we get on the podcast, I don't want to sit here and it just be this sales scheme for you to work with physique development. Like that is not my goal, but the service is that damn good to where I know that Every person listening to this would benefit from the service to where they will make tremendous strides beyond what they are right now. And so when I get on this podcast and I, I have these moments of like work with physique development to make this happen, that is not coming from a place of like, oh, golly, I hope they work with us. It's like, bro, I know you listening to this will benefit from our help. And so in those scenarios, having someone who understands programming and can really set you up for success is so much more pivotal than just getting a, a program that was written for your, your cousin, Susan, and you're hoping that you're having the same type of progress. Like if you really want to see yourself transform and improve, there are specific things that are personalized to you that have to be equated for. And that's how I periodize things. <laughs> I actually had a client start not too long ago and she was a little bit hesitant to start because she had worked with other coaches and spent thousands of dollars on other coaching services. And reading her onboarding form, we had some conversations talking about what we were going to do and she felt comfortable with moving on. And it looked like she was checking all the boxes. And I was a little bit confused of why is she not making the progress that she should be making here? And when I saw her first exercise execution video, I said, that's exactly it. And I told her in her onboarding, I said, I will get you to your goals. It might not look the, the way that you think it's going to look, but I can promise you if you send videos, that's going to be our saving grace. 
grace here. And within her response, there's obviously a lot more in her onboarding, but she said, thank you for finally being someone who not only understands my work and what I need, but really looking at the details. And she had worked with coaching services of people that I admire and I think are great services, but it was very obvious no one looked at her training. No one watched her train and truly saw how she was performing the exercises because three weeks in and she's already seen better results than she saw with a coach for 12 plus weeks. And I think that is just very powerful. And the way that we get so passionate about it is because we've seen it firsthand and we work we work with it every single day. And we're very adamant to all of our clients, the ones that send training videos have the best results. The ones that pay attention to the data have the best results. And if you're willing to learn and to grow and change, we can get you those results because we're going to explain it. We're going to answer questions and we're not just throwing something at the wall. We're taking a specified approach looking at what you do. If you are a bikini competitor who has competed well at the regional stage or at the national stage and not placed how you wanted, I would love the opportunity to work with you. If you would inquire via the link in the description box, that would be the first step. And from there, we'll get a call scheduled and I look forward to speaking with you. And so with that, I wanted to ask you how you do take notes about clients when it comes to their training volume and what it looks like for their their training allocation as a whole. Because I know that I have clients that do need deloads much sooner, whether it's because they're an advanced trainee or maybe they just have a lot of unmanaged or unmitigated stress in their life. And so their stress is too high that we do have to bring training down a little bit to be able to have trainability at all. But I know each person takes their notes a little bit differently for clients. So how do you lay out the volume um, for your clients? So this is going to come back to those intensity parameters and the sets that they can really train at that level of overall intensity. And when we look at notes, there's going to be a variability to the the training depending on where things are at from a nutrition perspective. And so I have separate notes as I accumulate more data for the, the client itself. There are going to be notes that are within the parameters of a dieting phase, for example, and there's going to be parameters that they're able to have in a surplus. And so when I'm looking at those two things, their ability to recover from the quantity of overall sets is going to be higher when our nutrition is at a higher allocation. And that makes sense more often than not. But I also think that there is a component here that we have to make sure that we're bringing to an understanding is that when we look at stress, it is only one cup. It's not that you have a separate cup for training stress and you have the separate cup for home stress, work stress, all these different factors. We are pouring into the same cup in its entirety. And so when we look at the training stress that comes about and then we have an individual who is going through a very stressful time in their life, for example, or going through a move or anything of that nature, we have to look at the stress that we have control over. And the stress that we have control over is going to be our cardio, it's going to be our training, it's going to be how we're sleeping and the focus that we have on our sleep. And so when we are in a situation that we have more lifestyle stress, it may be a good time for us to back off of overall training as well. And so we have to have all these things taken into consideration for a person when they're going through and and, or we're going through and, and creating a program for them to uh, navigate through moving over the next four to eight weeks. And so when we look at a, a true set number for someone to be able to perform, it is going to be very dependent on these different variables. And as I said, it's one of those things that we can have these general guidelines of 10 to 12 sets and being able to titrate those up and those different factors and those being spread over um, a week's worth of, of training volume, for example but also taking into consideration, and this is getting into more program design specificity, that we are wanting to train the tissue at different lengths as well and have emphasis in these different positions that allow for us to elicit the greatest response for whatever we're trying to create. And so we're going to be able to handle in a, let's look at it from a metabolic or endurance-based perspective, we're going to be able to handle a greater set allotment value in that shortened emphasis work that uh, we'll be able to adapt to because we're at a lesser 
total weight that's being lifted because of the rest periods that we have in place. And so in that setting, we're going to be able to handle more sets in general, but we have other variables that are allowing for that to be the case. Whereas if I have someone who is training for hypertrophy or for strength strides, the total amount of those sets may be lower, but we're having a greater emphasis and fatigue ratio that is coming about because of those exercises, because we experience a different level of fatigue when we're going through a Bulgarian split squat at a very high intensity threshold relative to our intensity that we're having in, let's say, a 45 degree hip extension. Those two are going to apply differently in the sense of how we're able to navigate through the entirety of an overall set and so are over an entire session or week of sessions. So we have to take into consideration the differences of how these exercises apply. Because if I am just looking at an individual performing 10 sets for a week, <clears throat> And those 10 sets accumulate through RDLs and they accumulate through back squats and Bulgarian split squats. That person is going to recover very differently than the individual who's doing those 10 sets as a glute max kickback, a 45 degree hip extension and barbell hip thrust. Like there's going to be a difference in overall ability to recover amongst those exercise selection. So when we look at total sets, this is where I get a little, I don't want to say bent out of shape, but feel as though that it's unnecessary to make that particular claim because it comes down to the exercise selection and how it's being performed that puts the value into those total sets. And so yeah, that's my thought yeah. process on how I accumulate the volume and those different factors. This became very evident when lockdown was going on and especially clients that maybe only had a barbell. And so they were performing not only a lot of spinal loading, but with a barbell, those are going to create more systemic fatigue than going with something like a kickback or a 45 degree hip extension. So we had to be very careful within programming. And that still holds true depending on if someone has limited equipment and and what you're taking into consideration. And I think that uh, with you talking about uh, those sets to failure and those being like short sessions because you like you don't have any more to do uh, in you uh, always reminds me, I feel like you and I have those sessions oftentimes when we're just in there and we're like, oh, let's let's do something. And we end up doing like only three movements or maybe two and a half movements because we have absolutely gassed ourselves. And I remember we used to get a little bit bent out of shape because it was, oh, I didn't get to do the whole session, but we have gotten so much better at understanding I have literally maxed out what I can give to this. It doesn't benefit me to still be in here at this time. So it's really cool how you can use these variables also based on if someone has limited time in the gym or if someone, like you mentioned earlier, really loves to train hard but needs to pull back and you can utilize those failure sets. Now, when it comes to failure, I find that sometimes it is difficult if someone hasn't done sports or trained with other people to really know what it's like to get to failure. And I really like to utilize RPE, and I have them write down per set what they feel like their RPE was while also sending a video to me and telling me what they felt like their RPE was at. And I know you briefly mentioned this earlier within those hard sets when they're feeling like they're that 9 to 10 RPE and those really counting. But I feel like that specifically has been really powerful for clients because uh, they're not just thinking, oh, this is hard. They're thinking, how many more reps can I actually do of this? Because there's been so many times where I've picked up a weight and I'm like, this is heavy and this is hard and I'll finish it. And you'll be like, that was like an RP six or seven. And I'm like, no, that was hard. And you're like, you easily had three or four reps. And when that clicks in my head, it's like, oh crap, I did have three or four reps in it. So it really was a six or a seven RPE is really, really helpful for me. And I found very great application with clients as well. Yeah, I think that the, like getting to utilize RPE is going to be something where it just is going to come over time. You're not going to start training today and have an accurate representation of, rate of perceived exertion, perceived, like you are the one, you're the eyes of the beholder or whatever. <laughs> and you're in a position where as you have more time and, and you're able to test yourself and challenge yourself, your accuracy of, of improving that scoring is just going to improve. And so 
the biggest thing with RPE is actually taking yourself to failure in controlled environments that are safe. I, I don't think that you should go into your local lifetime fitness today and load up a back squat and see if you can max out and see, you know, that's not what I'm saying to challenge yourself. Maybe you hop in the leg extension and you pick a weight that you would normally do for six. And then you see, is it really, am I failing at six or where do I get? And I've had clients do this and they get 12. And I'm like, okay, this is a problem. Like this is <laughs> the wrong way. This is why we're not seeing progress in this particular movement because you're actively sandbagging yourself and you've got to be in a better headspace to get after these sessions. And I think that some individuals find themselves in a situation where they have, let's say, um, barbell back squats at the beginning of their training session and the leg extensions later on in the session. And because of the just uh, order of importance for them in that program, the leg extensions are just kind of like there and they just do them lackadaisically, half texting on their phone and having these random rest periods, talking to their friends and all these different factors, having a five minute rest period and just kind of doing them haphazardly. And the reality is, is that every single exercise has extreme importance. The, the, the individual programming for you, I assure you, having written as many training programs of, as I have written, I would not just be throwing stuff in there just to just be throwing stuff in. in there. I've got other things I can do with my time that I would like to be doing than working in those scenarios. So like if, if I'm not just adding more time for me to work for fun. So that all being said, everything in the training is meant to be there and in the order that it is and so on and so forth. And so also the other side of, of being able to understand when to kind of pull back in a training session, that's going to also come with time. If you're at the beginning of your fitness journey, year one, two, three, your ability to self-analyze, am I pushing too far? Am I not pushing enough? Is pretty challenging. And I don't know if this is a hot take, but I would encourage you push the boundary. Like don't undershoot, overshoot, because this is what's going to really teach you how to better analyze these things moving forward. Because if you're just chronically undershooting, you really don't know where the boundary is. You don't know where your limit, you don't know where the ceiling is. You're truthfully cutting yourself off every single time. Yeah, so you're just putting yourself at this glass ceiling. And so you want to push past that glass ceiling, break through the glass ceiling, have yourself be excessively sore for four, five, six days. Go through that to understand of like, yo, this is this is the boundary here. And I've got a kind of a guardrail to put myself into. And I think that that's a really important piece as you're looking to self-analyze your own program design and those different factors and, and put yourself in the best position to have success moving forward. Because I oftentimes see within individuals who come to work with us, that the two things that they often are not doing well is executing the movements properly and then training with intensity. And sometimes they'll have one or the other, but because of having one or the other, the other is really bad. And so then that also is not going to allow for you to make the progress that you want to make. And so you have to combine the two things and have like a 80% plus threshold for both of them to have the success that you want to see from a body composition perspective or maximizing hypertrophy or strength or whatever the situation may be for you to see the results that you want to see. And I don't know if this is a hot take, but I believe that you should get good at just following a plan and recognizing that being in tune with your body is going to come from that. I think so many people try to be in tune with their body before they can be, before they know what that even looks like. And exactly what you said within lifting, that they're cutting themselves short every single time. And that's why I think it can be so beneficial of I'm following a plan and I'm just doing it. And then I overshoot and I figure it out or I've done it enough times. And I've always been of the thought process of flexibility first requires consistency. And you got to nail your shit down before you start moving around or thinking you have the ability to, to move all of that around and have this extreme flexibility to get to that point. Amen. I feel like we gave everyone a really good breakdown of deloads and how we utilize them and program periodization, training intensity, all the things. Is there anything else you'd like to share with everyone? The only other thing I want to mention is one thing we didn't mention throughout this podcast is food. And your nutrition and training does need to be matched up. And that is another really important thing when it comes to having a coach. And that can be a reason that you're not seeing the progress or need a deload because you might be under eating or under fueling 
fueling yourself. And that's what's causing all of these uh, symptoms that we talked about earlier. So while we did really focus mainly on training here, recognize there is a whole nother side of a nutrition component that does come into play. And just because we didn't deep dive into it for this episode doesn't mean that they do not go hand in hand because they very much so do. And there's a lot more that we could go into on just nutrition as well. That's all we have for you today. Make sure you like and subscribe and you share this with a friend and we'll catch you in the next one.